Good evening, friends. Welcome to our first Martin Luther Chapel midweek devotion for Lent. Starting tonight, I want to review the most basic Christian beliefs. So tonight, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the Ten Commandments. Then next Wednesday, the topic will be the Creed. And the following week, March 23rd, we'll talk about prayer, specifically the Lord's Prayer. And on March 30, we'll discuss baptism. And then we'll finish up on April 6th with the Lord's Supper. So let's begin. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 113 says, From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And the prophet Joel urges us to return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So let's return to the Lord in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, we implore you to grant your blessing upon us this day and always. Sanctify us, govern our hearts and our bodies. Watch over us, bless us, and direct us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We, uh, we depend on God. We depend on him to preserve us in body and soul. And we know that, uh, that he is gracious because he has revealed that to us in his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he's given us his Holy Spirit so that, so that in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, we have God's presence, his love, and his purpose at work in our lives. Commandments are found in the Bible. They're in Exodus chapter 20 and again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now if you read them in their full biblical shape, they're, they're kind of lengthy, a whole entire column for the Ten Commandments here in Exodus chapter 20. But for the purposes of teaching, it's, it's helpful to kind of summarize them and they're, they're quite easily summarized. In our church we do that in that little book we call Luther's Small Catechism. And I want to just remind you of the commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, 
you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Three, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Four, honor your father and mother. Five, you shall not murder. Six, you shall not commit adultery. Seven, you shall not steal. Eight, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. And 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, when you kind of abbreviate the commandments like that, they still cover all the basic things that are right here in the scripture, but they're easier for people to commit to memory and to learn. And most people, when they hear the commandments, they recognize that they're really pretty good rules. And actually, they make so much common sense that even people who aren't believers tend to agree with at least the commandments that have to do with how we treat other people. We agree that it's important to respect parents. Everybody knows that murder is a bad thing. And almost everyone believes that couples shouldn't sleep around, that, uh, that people should be faithful in their marriage. And of course, stealing is wrong. Nobody wants somebody to take our things and it's wrong to take that of others. And it's the same with false testimony. Imagine what would happen if everybody lied in court and even in everyday life. Maybe the coveting thing is a little more tricky, um, but generally we can admire somebody's house, but we don't try to get it by hook or by crook. We know that wouldn't be right. We just want one that's like theirs or maybe a little bit better. And so people tend to think of the commandments when they pay any attention as, yeah, they're pretty good rules. The world's a better place when nobody's breaking them. Breaking them means chaos. And that's all very important. The Bible in Romans chapter two says that non-believers follow the commandments because in some way or another, the, the law is written on their hearts, God's law, and their conscience is bearing witness to, to the law of God. And so the commandments have this tremendous practical value. And, and one way or another, if you go around the whole world, almost everybody has rules that, that coincide with the commandments for trying to keep chaos at bay, trying to maintain order in life and society. But as Christians, we know there's something more to the commandments. Well, first and foremost, they come from God himself. And they aren't just about how we treat other people. They're also about our relationship with God. Think of the first three commandments, which as we were talking about how they keep chaos at bay in society, we didn't mention at all. But the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. That commandment implies that, well, there are other gods out there that we might want instead of the real God. And there are, there's tons of them, but they're all false gods because there's only one supreme being, the creator of the universe. Nothing is greater than that one God, nothing more important. And yet think about it. We ignore God all the time. We forget all about him. We get all caught up in other things as if they, whatever, whoever they are, they're the most important thing. And in so doing, without ever calling those things a God, that's what they are. And so Martin Luther explained this commandment, you shall have no other gods, very simply. He said, well, we should fear, love, and trust in God, the real one, above all things. That's how easily you can explain this commandment. It's, it's simple in that way. Remember that God is number one. He is the judge. For that reason, we owe him a healthy fear, fear of his judgment and condemnation. But God is more than a judge. He loves us with a father's love. He provides and protects. And so we also owe him love and, and he is wise and good. And so we owe him our trust. And so also the second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Now that one generally people kind of scoff at. It's just words, right? So they say whatever they want to say, but, but think of it. Is it right to misuse the name of God who is, who is number one in all the world, who gives us his name so that we would come to him in prayer and that we would speak of him in ways that show what a, what a wonderful, good, and gracious God he is? And the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Again, it's easy for us to scoff at that commandment because it's so easy to find something more important to do on Sunday than to worship. Who really needs church? It's just an external thing, say some people. I worship in my heart, they might add. Well, I hope we do all worship in our hearts, but church is a really big deal because it's built around the word of God, where we gather together with fellow believers to encourage one another with with simply our presence. And we hear the word, we read the word, we sing the word, we preach it. We rejoice in the word as it's, as it's made visible in Holy Communion. And those are the things 
that draw us close to God again and again and again and keep us from falling away entirely. And so sure, the commandments are wonderful because they prevent chaos, but, but they're also God's will for his people, for all people. His will for our lives, for how we live, and for the things that we value. And so we have to take them really deeply and not superficially, because if you look at the commandments superficially, you might think, well, I'm fine, I've never murdered anybody. Don't cheat on my wife. But do you remember what Jesus said one time? He said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But I say anyone who calls his neighbor you fool is liable to judgment. Whoa. Jesus makes us think about these commandments. What's really going on inside us is vitally important because where do you think murder comes from? It comes from what's going on inside a person, their rage, their anger, their, their sense that somebody is an utter fool or worse and, and they deserve to die. Now, when you think deeply about the commandments, when you let Jesus help you understand them, you realize how these commandments also do something that's tremendously important spiritually. Now, we can't look at them superficially. That'll just make us feel like we're all self-righteous. I'm not, I'm not a bad person. I'm not in jail. I must be good with God. But no, God's commandments, his law, goes far beyond simply the rules that we need to prevent chaos. His law does have that practical purpose, but it also has this deeply spiritual purpose. Paul puts it like this, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. The law, God's commandments, act like a mirror that shows us our faults. It shows us our faults so much that we can see how deeply we have to have God's help. Without him, we're in trouble with, with all the ways that we fail, with all the ways we forget about him, ignore him, scorn him. We deserve his judgment, his punishment. And so the commandments, well, they call us to repent. They call us to return to the Lord our God. And when we do, we see just how wonderful he is. He is our God, our Father, our Creator, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Sanctifier. And then, then when we think about the commandments, knowing God as gracious Lord and Savior, they take on yet another meaning for believers because they, they're reminders of what goodness really is. Goodness starts with God, with his presence, with his blessings, with what he does for us and for the world day by day by day. Goodness is, is living a life that is close to God that rejoices in him, that praises him, that is thankful for him, that finds comfort and peace and protection in him. Goodness is, is letting God show us how to live with one another, how I, how I should think of the people around me. Goodness shows us the responsibilities that we have, the goodness that is so evident in the commandments, a responsibility that can be summed up in love for God and love for the neighbor. What a gift the commandments are. Spend a little time with them. Rejoice in them. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine
just close I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine till Jesus comes I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine till Jesus comes I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let us pray. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, Psalm 24, verse 1. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. First Chronicles 29, 11, 12, and 13. O oh God, our Father, you made us and we are yours. You protect us and defend us, and you seek to guide us in the way that is right and holy. Help us, Lord, ever to see our sins and our failures so that we are your humble, repentant people. But also, Lord, help us to see the way of goodness that you reveal to us. And so let us never ignore your commands, but give thanks that you give your law and that it reminds us both of our sin and, and that it points us to our need for the Savior that you are in Christ Jesus. Oh, Lord, we come before you and pray for peace in this troubled world, in this troubled time. We pray for those who are the leaders of the nations. We pray for those whom we love who are sick or suffering from one distress or another, all whom we name before you in our hearts. We pray for your healing, your presence, your guidance, and your direction day by day. All this we pray for you have taught us to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God's blessings to you, and may you have a, a restful night and a joyful tomorrow. In Jesus' name, goodbye.